Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Clive Stafford-Smith to Gresham College. What we're going to talk about tonight, I think, to begin with, is this question, and you have to vote. And if you don't vote, I've, earned, I, I've learned an awful lot about torture from my American friends. So the, the question is this. When it comes to human rights, who do you think is right? And you have to vote one way or the other, right? So on one side is Benito Mussolini. Uh, on the other side is my mum, Jean Stafford-Smith, the late um, Jean Stafford-Smith, who sadly died last year. So who's going to vote that Benito Mussolini has it right on, um, on human rights? Oh, there's always one, isn't there? Oh, two. Okay, all right, all right. Um, who's going to vote that my mum is more likely to have it right than Benito Mussolini? See, I think there's a clear victory for my mum. You know, we really can do away with this lecture, but we can all go to the pub now and save a lot of time. You guys already know the truth. So that's easy. Yeah, so let's go right to Benito. You see, the thing about Benito, there was, a, there was an article in the New York Review of Books two months ago, which I thought was very good, and it was reviewing a book called Wannabe Fascism. Um, and it had this quote in it, from Benito. Uh, in every society, Benito Mussolini said, there is a need for a part of the citizens who must be hated. So that's what you voted for, mate. <laughs> that's right. Um, and that's one way of looking at the world we're in. And we are in an era when populism, as they call it, is, uh, is very threatening. I don't look, you know, I'm not going to use the word fascism because really it's too easy, right? And you alienate a lot of people the moment you use it. But we'll use populism in the sense that Benito meant it, right? Then there's my mum. And my mum, this is what she, most of, if there's anything nice about me at all, it comes from my mum. It's certainly not from my dad, um, who I've written a book about explaining uh, my deep personal flaws. Uh, my mum said, if you're privileged, then you must look around the world for the most hated and get between them and the haters. Uh, who in this room thinks they're privileged? Come on, put your hands up, everyone. Of course, you're all privileged. Of course, you are. And one of the things that, that's interesting about that notion of privilege is um, a conversation I had with my son, Wilf, who's 16, but this was when he was 10. And Wilf was wondering about my mum, because my mum loved to do the lottery. And Wilf was saying, why does she do that, Dad? You know, I do math, and, you know, really doesn't have a chance of winning. And so I was telling him, look, you know, it's just a tax on poor people, really. But Wilf, you don't need to do the lottery, because you've already won the greatest lottery known to humanity. And this is a sign of how indoctrinated my poor son is. Immediately at age 10, he said, oh, you mean I was born a privileged chap in England? And I say, exactly, that's what I mean. And one of the deranged ideas in the world is that because you were randomly born in this country, somehow you have a right to everything this country has and that you can just keep it and you can stop other people from having it. That's wacko, right? So, this is the subject of my lecture is, who's right, Benito Mussolini or my mum? I think you got it already. So, there's this. What I view my world about is about looking around the world at the vilified minority, about the people who are most hated. And there was this in this article in the New York Review. The connective tissue between Vladimir Putin, Viktor Orban, and Donald Trump has been their common enemies, immigrants, Muslims, LGBT communities, globalist liberal elites, cancel culture, and George Soros. Now, I think that's a bit broad, right? I don't really... Uh, George Soros, nice chap. I've met him several times. He funded my life for five years, for which I'm eternally grateful. He's a good guy. But I don't really worry about rich people. I don't really worry about the elites. They can look after themselves. They are not the vilified minority. It's not to say we shouldn't go to bat for them when they get in trouble. Some of us uh, do-gooders. I like the term do-gooder, because when they call me a do-gooder, I remind them that the opposite is a do-badder. 
uh, and do good as it is fine by me. But we do get picked on every now and then. I have indeed been prosecuted five times for representing people that the US government didn't like. And it's not much fun when it's going on. And when those things are happening, you do want to have some friends and allies on your side. So I'm not saying ignore things when George Soros is blamed for all the sins of the world, because we should be on his side. But he's not one of the vilified minorities. This is what my mum would talk about. My mum was a Tory, right? I mean, she voted Tory from about the time this college was established. What was that, 1580? 1597, she voted from them until she died last year. Um, but she was a libertarian Tory, and she was a fundamentally decent human being, who she and I would have agreed a lot more if she hadn't read the Daily Telegraph the whole time. But um, she told me about the vilified minorities. And when you look around them, I suppose the one thing that I would certainly agree with that article on is the LGBT community. Although it's important to know that your little world, you young people, is so much more civilized than my world, right? The very first case I ever did at Columbia Law School, I was representing a British guy who was being deported because he was gay. And under American immigration law, being gay qualified as a mental illness. I mean, they're totally crazy, right? And, you know, here we are, some, some years later, the conservative Supreme Court in the US, the conservative party in Britain, has uh, recognized the right to gay marriage. And it's not that there aren't still threats. If you look at Ms. Maloney in Italy, she's against you know, gay people getting married and all that sort of stuff. And you know, I do think it's a truth universally recognized that, um, that if you're British, like me, and if you went, for example, to a boarding school like Radley, um, and if you were taught sex education by a priest at Radley, then you're going to be a bit screwed up on all things sexual, right, when you're a kid. And the British are always know <laughs> there's someone there who probably went to my boarding school, I don't know. But, um, you know, the things that we pick on, and the current one, obviously, is the trans debate. And one of the things that populists do is they not only pick on a small group, they pick on a small group who they want you to hate, and they make stuff up. I mean, honestly, do you really believe that every person who's trans is becoming trans so they can go into women's changing rooms, or that they can win at games of tennis? I mean, this stuff is just, again, the legal term is utter bullshit. But we need to be there to protect people, and I'm glad to say your, your generation, God, you're better than my generation. Um, the Roma, fascinating. This is a quote from Matthew Paris. It's time we stop pandering to travelers. Now, Matthew Paris, decent Tory, by and large. I've dealt with him on a number of things. But this is madness, right? Hating the Roma. You know, and, and they, the whole bunch of the Roma came to my mother's village one time, and everyone had a, a village hall meeting about how we needed to get them off the village green. And it does make you think, I mean, I don't know about you, but I live in the countryside and I really don't approve of rich people having vast swathes of land as they do in feudal Dorset. And I believe in the right to roam. I, who here agrees that we should have the right to roam over? Put your hands up, I want to see you. Right, well, the Roma, that's what they do, they roam. And why shouldn't they roam? And all the Roma I've met are perfectly nice people, but we vilify them in a way that is just pathetic. Then, asylum seekers. Goodness gracious. Now, this is important, right? Because when you become an advocate, you're going to need to know how to advocate. And you need to learn this lesson from my old friend, Uncle Joe. Now, Joseph Stalin, sage person that he was, said, if you murder a million people, it's just a statistic. If you murder one person, it's homicide and you go to prison for it key thing in representing people who are vilified is to figure out the tragic, tragic stories. Everyone remembers that picture, right? And it doesn't matter if I tell you that 30,000 people have crossed that little strait between, uh, between Turkey and Greece. That's what you remember. Remember that when you're being an advocate. Now, death row prisoners, when I first went to America, the vilified minority I wanted to help 
were people on death row. And the reason for that goes back to when I was 12. And I was reading a history book, and uh, they were burning Joan of Arc at the stake. And, you know, I was a British boy, so I thought killing French people was kind of cool. But when you saw this... Sorry, are you French? <laughs> oh, I'm very sorry. I really like you now. It was, that was when I was 12. Um, so I really do like the French. You're just, you know what makes you civilized? It's that you, you have a fresh loaf of bread every day. I think that's so cool. And the fact that you're working... No, no, no. The fact that you did cut your working week to 35 hours, fabulous. It's just your subsequent governments are ruining it all. Anyway, um, when I was looking at the history book and they were burning Joan of Arc at the stake, she looked just like my sister Mary. And Mary and I have had our differences over the years, but I really don't think she should be burned at the stake. And really, Joan of Arc's only crime was she won a few battles against the English. And so I thought, this is awful, awful. And then when you think about vilification, I've had 400 cases, yeah, during the death penalty, and I've lost six. And I've had to go to the execution in each of those cases, right? And it's not the highlight of my life doing that. There's something unbelievable when you go to someone's execution and there's crowds outside screaming for death and they want to kill this person who I've represented for a while and grown to quite like. Um, and somehow they think that killing a few young black men normally is going to solve all the problems in America, which is the big populist lie, right? And the other problem with populist lies is that so often they get it wrong, even if you consider the death penalty okay. This is Chris Maharaj. I represented Chris Maharaj since 1993. I got six members of the Colombian cartel to admit they did the murder. I went down to Colombia and talked to these folk, and they still wouldn't let Chris out because the populists won't admit that they make mistakes. They won't admit, admit that the emperor wears no clothes. But there are a couple I want to touch on that I think are going to be a little more problematic for you guys. And one is criminals. Huh. Who here thinks we should have um, prison for people? Put your hand up if you believe they do. You see, most of you do. Yeah, well, I mean, prison. And we didn't have prisons 200 years ago. You know, prisons resurfaced after a long break from Demosthenes in 400 BCE, they resurfaced in Thomas More's Utopia, which is why I don't think he quite got it right. Um, we didn't have prisons not long ago at all. It was an evolution that has been a total nightmare and a dreadful thing to do to people. And I want you to think about that, because we do tend to all hate criminals, and I can't stand that word. But now we're going to have the group that even... Guardian readers hate. Who is it? Who's the group? Pedophiles. Absolutely right. Who was that? Well done. Well, it's totally true, right? Does everyone now agree with him now he's said it? You know, I, I, well, anyway, I won't tell you the stories about what people at the Guardian have said to me. But who's this? Gary Glitter. Gary Glitter. And what's this? It's, the, it's not the same guy. It's the guy acting him in a 2009 film that Channel 4 made about executing Gary Glitter because we hate him so much. Now, I've represented a bunch of pedophiles, and obviously there are issues going on there. Put your hand up if you would choose to be a pedophile. Yeah, you see, they always titter. But it's a serious question. Put your hand up if you think that someone who's a pedophile probably has what we loosely call a mental illness. Of course, of course. Now, I don't like the term mental illness, but uh, of course that's true. And we hate them so much that we come up with these ludicrous things, most of which we borrow from America. And I should say I am American too, so I get to apologize for that as well. Um, and so, you know, we had the scarlet letter law in New Orleans when I was working there, which is if you're a pedophile and you're convicted, when you move into my neighborhood in New Orleans, you had to send me a postcard saying you'd moved into my neighborhood. And, you know, I got two of these postcards, and my wife and I, we marched over there to say, you know, we're going to represent you if you get 
you know, terrible things done to you. But both times, people had thrown stones through their windows, they'd been driven underground, and obviously then the whole cycle of problems continues. These are the wacko things we do about people we really hate. And it's why, if I had nothing else to do in life, I, and I was a British lawyer, which I'm not, I would represent pedophiles. Now, these are the, the vilified minorities that people love to hate, and there are lots more of them, and you know all about them. We'll talk more about them later. But we need to know what the vilified minorities most need. What do they most need? Help. Power, actually, is what they need. They, the second thing they need is power, and the third thing they need is power. They need people on their side who can bring them power. That's what you lot need to do for the next 70 years. We'll get to a commitment a bit later on. Now, what does that mean? And this is where I want to go into the difference between Britain and America, because with due respect to all my great colleagues from Britain, you just don't have it. I, as an American lawyer, have so much more power than a British lawyer. It's unbelievable, and we have to analyze why that's true. I'm going to boast in a minute, because I always do. I was the first person to sue Donald Trump, and I did it only because I was watching, and he was being sworn in. My mother-in-law was saying, there are people around him with guns. Why doesn't one of them shoot him? And I said, you can't say that. That gets you 40 years in prison. But I was waiting until he finished what he was saying, swearing in, and then I press go on the button because I wanted to be the first person to sue him. And I've sued the President of the United States 88 times, and I've lost once. And I'm really bitter about a case I lost, and I'm going to turn that around. Because that's because we as Americans have immense power. And um, this is what you need. First, you need real legal rights. With respect, you ain't got them in Britain. We'll talk about it in a minute. You need rights that are truly enforceable. With respect, you don't have them. You need access to help at all times, and that access to help has to be free help, because the vilified minority doesn't have any money. George Soros does. He can defend himself, but the people that I'm talking about don't. So, do they get the power they need in Britain? I don't think so. Do they in America? Surprisingly, yes. And I find myself in a strange position saying great things about the American system, because after all, I've bitched about it for the last 40 years. But it is actually in many ways wonderful, and we need to work on it. So the first thing is, in Britain, the Human Rights Act. Is that truly power for you to help the people who need it? And of course it's not, for reasons we'll get into in a minute. Is it enforceable? If you look around the uh, people who have signed up to the ECHR, uh, these are the ones who are in special measures, they call it. I love it. It sounds like they are, as I think they are, truly intellectually disabled. Because you've got, you know, Erdogan from Turkey, Maloney from, from Italy, and uh, or Viktor Orban from Hungary in the top ten. But Belgium's there, too, of countries that simply don't enforce the rulings of the ECHR. And when you look at the cases that they don't enforce, they're all when you're picking on people that Victor Orban and Ms. Maloney don't like. So, you know, Kavala versus Turkey is a human rights defender who the court says you've got to let him out because he hasn't done anything wrong. He's just trying to help people. And Erdogan wouldn't do it, just doesn't do it, right? Then you've got the DH versus the Czech Republic, which is about the Roma. And in that case, the Roma kids proved, there were 18 of them, proved that they were putting in, put in special education and they were taught, said to be intellectually disabled without any evidence, just because they were Roma kids. And that way they were denied access to university and all sorts of things. Now, the Czech Republic lost that case, so did two other countries, and they still haven't enforced it. But actually, in a way, the worst one is from right here, which is votes for criminals. You have to think about whether, when he came down from Mount Sinai, Moses had a tablet that said criminals shouldn't have the right to vote. It was total nonsense, right? You know where the, the disenfranchisement comes from? It comes from Georgia 
where I practiced for nine years, and Georgia was the first state to come up with this idea, and they did it solely to disenfranchise African-American people after the Civil War. That's where it all comes from, but we copied it. And we said 70,000 people in Britain should be denied the right to vote. Why? Now, when the, the ECHR said, you can't do that, guys, this is what our then Prime Minister said. He said, the idea of letting prisoners have the right to vote makes me physically ill, and it won't happen while I'm Prime Minister. Now, I, we're going to talk at another time about the First Amendment, which is the finest of all our constitutional rights that you people don't have in Britain. But you have hate speech, right? We don't have hate speech in America because you can't possibly prosecute someone for just being a twat. Um, you know, you have a right to say really, really stupid things if you want. The only answer to bad ideas are better ideas. Now, I did think, though, before I decided, oh, I'll be such a hypocrite, I did think about going after a private prosecution against the Prime Minister for hate speech. Because you can't say things like that. You can't say things like that about a vilified minority of, cr of people we label criminals um, who you think shouldn't get the right to vote. And he's also stupid. In my experience, with all my clients in America, they all vote Republican. I work so hard to get them not to, but they do. So it's pretty unwise for the Tories to do that because I, I, I don't think they would lose votes. But the other people in the Tory party, this was interesting. You know who that guy is, Zach Goldsmith, who's a nice chap. I know his, his sister very well. And um, he said, MPs almost unanimously rejected votes for prisoners. If it happens all the same, in, in other words, if the ECHR makes us do it, does that mean the UK Parliament officially no longer matters? The UK government voted 234 to 22 that prisoners shouldn't get the right to vote. That's picking on a vilified minority by the government, and it's why we need to protect our clients from the government, because the government's normally the problem. And then you even had, I ran into him, Dominic Grieve, right about the time it was on the underground, and Dominic, he's a really nice chap, Dominic, and he was Attorney General. But when I saw him on the underground, he was picking some very fine wines off a wine list. So I tried to invite myself round, but I didn't get to go. But he said, Parliament is sovereign in this area. No one can impose a solution on Parliament. Fundamentally, that's your problem in Britain. Parliamentary supremacy. I plan to have a rant about just that alone next time because it so pisses me off, it's such a madness. The whole point of the law is to protect people who need protection from the haters, and the haters are very often the people in Parliament, like this guy. You know, I love that picture, don't you? It makes him look such a dork. Um, so he said, we must leave the ECHR altogether. The Rwanda bill about asylum seekers allows illegal migrants to make drawn-out individual appeals and provides insufficient protections against activist injunctions from the Strasbourg court. So when they're talking about someone they hate, in Britain they want to get out of the ECHR altogether. In Cameron's case, he just said, I'm not going to obey it. In Jenrick's case, he says, well, let's just get out of it. This is crazy, crazy. And to an American lawyer, the idea that you just withdraw from the Constitution is just crazy, crazy. And so even when it involves a dubious felon like that chap, he's still got the Bill of Rights, and the Bill of Rights is incredibly powerful in the right hands. Who knows who that is? It's not Bin Laden. No, it's actually Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, but he's a big mate of Bin Laden. And he's currently in Gitmo. And um, when we sued them in Rasul versus Bush, we, I brought that suit in February the 19th, 2002. But it was just crazy, crazy that the government of George Bush was taking these Muslims down to Cuba to give them no rights. So we sued them on that day and with two of my mates. 
and Fox Television wanted one of us to go on to defend it. Well, I've never had a TV, so I'd never actually watched Fox TV. The others ran away as fast as possible. I said, oh no, this is a matter of principle for me. I'm going to go defend it. So I went on Fox TV. I was accused of being a traitor to America 13 times in a five-minute interview. And even though I had an unlisted number, Boy, they found me, and uh, the death threats. They were good for fundraising. Death threats are good for fundraising. But I got a lot that night for representing these people. Anyway, this is the thing. The conservative court ruled 6-3 that even the people we most hated, and KSM was allegedly actually behind the idea of 9-11, that even KSM should have the right to habeas corpus and legal rights under the US Constitution. That's power, right? And, you know, one of the great things about populists is when they decide to hate people, they're always wrong. Um, you know, they always are. This, this unilateral hatred is always wrong. The number of innocent people on death row just drives me batty. I hate representing innocent people. Give me a good guilty person any time. Because then you just get to discuss, you know, why people do things, which is a really interesting issue. Whether they did them is just a TV series, and it's not in the least bit interesting, although the Americans make it interesting in the crazy things they do. But in Guantanamo, we had 780 people in Guantanamo who Donald Rumsfeld, do you remember Donald? He said they're the worst of the worst terrorists in the world. And when we sued, I thought, you know, this is a matter of principle, but I'm going to have some tough explaining to do when I go down to Gitmo because there's going to be some people who really were on the battlefield doing all sorts of bad things. I got down there eventually when we won in the Supreme Court, and I had a really hard time finding an honest-to-goodness terrorist. And I did find this guy. How old are you guys? 13. Okay, so we, we could take you to get more right now. Uh, he was just 14 when he was taken to Guantanamo. His name is, well, I called him Yusuf, but he's Mohammed El Gharani. And he was brought up in, in Saudi Arabia, and he spoke Saudi Arabian Arabic. And because he's black, and boy, does Saudi Arabia make Mississippi look good when it comes to race, um, he couldn't get a secondary education. So he went to Pakistan to get a secondary education when he was 14 years old, smart kid. Um, and then the Pakistanis turned him in for a bounty, for money. And the US starts interrogating him. But because we don't speak Arabic, which I confess I don't, they used a Yemeni translator to interrogate this kid from Saudi Arabia. And the word zalat in Yemeni Arabic means money. But in Saudi Arabic, it means salad or tomatoes. So they start interrogating Muhammad. When you went to Pakistan, what zalat did you have with you? And he thought they were crazy. He told me, I didn't need to take tomatoes with me to Pakistan. I could get them anywhere I wanted. So he said, I, had, I didn't have any zalat. Today. You had to have zalat. No, no, I could get it anywhere. So they got really excited. And as a CIA agent, come on, who's going to be my CIA agent? What are you thinking when he says that he could get zalat anywhere he wanted? Well connected, but what sort of terrorist is he? Al well, definitely Al Qaeda, but what part of Al Qaeda? He's a financier, right? He's a, clearly, clearly. So they decided he was an Al Qaeda financier, and they interrogate him about, you know, where could you get your your zealot? And he listed a number of vegetable stalls in Karachi, and the CIA wrote them down. And that became the big allegation against him. And I, end up, I have represented 87 people in Guantanamo so far, 85 of them are out. We have exonerated, look at this, 763 of the 780. That's 97.8%. Who here can think of a single practice that's used in the world where they screw up 97.8%. I was talking to a stewardess on the British Airways flight, which was much better than the one coming this way, I'll tell you, uh, which wasn't BA, 
And I said, how would you feel if 97.8% of the time your plane went to the wrong airport? Or maybe your plane crashed. Would you, would you be uh, working on these, this airline? And she said, of course not. You know, it's crazy we have that. So in America, we have that power. Now, what you need to think about next is, do you have access to help? Now, this is a huge problem in Britain. In America, I finish law school, I take the bar exam, and then I, I tried my first capital trial a year out of law school, which don't do, folks, don't. Get a little experience before you're doing a death penalty case. But, um, but in this country, it's incredibly hard. For people who begin wanting to become barristers, 4% of those who start the process get there because of all the crazy things you have in the way. And so if you want to be some great human rights advocate, it's incredibly difficult for a lot of reasons. You know, you don't have charities in your lens. In my office in your lens, we incubated a bunch of legal action charities. We had six in there at one time. That's more legal action charities than the whole of Great Britain. This picture is Andy Malkinson. My wife represented him. Her organization, Appeal, which was founded along American lines, is purely a charity. It's one of the only charities in Britain. You've got to have it, because the government is just not going to pay you to do the work that you need to do, because they hate your clients. Then you've got all these other things. I'm sorry about you, you guys are the wigs. <laughs> what is it? I mean, I think you've got a good head of hair, so you don't need one. I think it's a very strange thing. But in this country, to get legal aid, you have to make quite a showing. Not so in America. You've just got constitutional rights. You get it. And you don't have to make any showing to litigate what you want to for someone if you're doing it for free. We have free speech. We'll get into that on another day. You know, this country has all of these rich people. And um, then when I was trying to sue the British government about whether they were involved in the American torture, they wanted my little charity to put up £50,000 in a protective cost order just to represent the people I was trying to help for nothing. You know, this is crazy stuff. In America, we have none of that. We can just go ahead and represent anyone we want. So, the real question is, how do we truly bring power to them? And this is another area where Britain sadly fails, and that's the court of public opinion. It's, it's another Guantanamo fact, but while I've represented lots and lots of people in Guantanamo, only two out of 763 a court has ordered their release. The others have all been released because we went in there, we got the facts and liberated the truth out of there, and, uh, and as a result, we embarrassed the hell out of the government and they let them go. And the court of public opinion is incredibly important. And the reason I prefer to use advocate than lawyer is you don't have to be a lawyer. There is a fabulous study, which you're all going to agree with, the British lawyers among you. In America, there are three groups of people who come out sociopathic on the MMPI psychological test. And those three groups of people are doctors, lawyers, and mass murderers. So my profession in America is in the same class. But, um, but we, can, we can use the power of you as a journalist or you as an investigator to do tremendous good. Now, there are lots of other problems in Britain, and I'm going to get into all of these over the next few weeks and months. But your publication restrictions. I was trying to put up bail for Mozambique when they locked him up, and the judge, who was at Radley when I was head boy and should have remembered I was the boss, but he didn't, um, ask all the media if they want to report on what's going on in court. And I said, yeah, I do, because I think what you're doing is idiotic. But the media said no, and the judge made it illegal for us to discuss what he'd just done. Defamation, crazy, crazy stuff. You can't do it in America. I can say what I like about the president. No one's going to be able to sue me, because we've got a First Amendment. Privacy. British people are crazy. You cannot have free speech if you have privacy. So many limitations on what you can say that's going to protect the people who are vilified. And if you go after a rich person, they're going to go after you with all the money. Now, then all of this comes down to a big issue here, which is, and don't, don't you lawyers, don't say, where is Britain's Guantanamo Bay? 
Okay, open it up to the wider audience. Where is Britain's Guantanamo Bay? It's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's Belmarsh, right? Belmarsh is vastly worse than Guantanamo. I've been to Belmarsh several times. The security stuff, you know, I as an American lawyer see all that secret stuff, they trust me. And I can talk to my client about whatever I am legitimately allowed to say. Not so in this country. The, the, the system that you have in Belmarsh is much worse than Guantanamo Bay, yet we've all heard of Guantanamo. We haven't heard of Belmarsh as the same thing, but it's far, far worse. And that's, again, because you don't have the power in your system to expose what they're up to. Now, the real issue that this ultimately comes down to, which is fascinating, I hadn't really thought about it till I was trying to pick on your legal system, which is great fun. Um, and you don't have to agree with me, I just want people to think. But the real issue is parliamentary supremacy. And just as a teaser, you know, when Parliament insisted it was supreme, it was insisting it was supreme over the king who would go around chopping people's heads off, you know, whether they were his enemy or his wife. Um, and that was what it was really all about. It wasn't about Parliament being supreme over judges. Judges are there for a purpose. The legal system is there for a purpose. It's to protect the weak. That's what human rights are about. It's about protecting the weak. Now, there are flaws in the American system, but it protects the weak vastly more effectively than the British system. And in the end, the real issue is this. Look, this is what it's really all about. It's about us using our privilege to protect the people who really need protection. And that's what I'm going to talk about in various different ways for probably ad nauseum, May Martin, for the next um, three years. So much fun. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Right.